did it. We made it. <laughs> we made it. We've we've officially made you? it. I you know I'm I'm good. I'm okay. How are you? How's how's everything? It looks it looks beautiful where you are. Oh, thank you. It's my it's my room. I should be in the office, but I'm too I'm tired. I'm I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> we were out until um, my husband and I. We were out until three o'clock in the morning, which like. We're both getting too old for that shit. Like, way too old for that. We went um, down to Long Beach Island for a screening for to screen uh, the subject at the Lighthouse Film Festival, and it was like like an hour and forty minute, hour and forty five minute drive each way. <laughs> and they wow. started it at ten thirty, and I was like, oh, that's middle age midnight. Like, you can't be starting shit at after ten, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Was there a time, okay, so I, am I allowed to ask how old you are? Is that appropriate or acceptable? I, I, I don't know I'm any. I'm 40. Mm, I'm a 23rd, oh, sorry. Oh, congratu congratulations. Welcome to the club. I'm 43. So, oh, so yeah. yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Hello, it's, comrade. Um, <laughs> exactly. And I, I, I get it. Like, my girlfriend and I, we, we, oh, man, we go to bed at like nine, you know? I'm like, I'm kind of done after a specific time now i'm like i can't do do this shit like i can't keep up with most people anymore you know <laughs> but i think it's also like you value sleep yes. much more uh, you know as you get older yes. yes i need it i need i need to like to the point where like you know how they say like when you sleep you're like sorry can you hear my dog chewing on a bone over there He's, no but it's can't. But it, but it's fine. It's fine if if the bone is being chewed. It's totally okay. Yeah, it's totally okay. It makes this more realistic. It makes it better. <laughs> oh sure, sure. But um, as you can see, I have the attention span of a flea. Um, but yeah, when you sleep, you're you're like rec recovering. Your body is healing from things, and it's like re, you know, I don't know, re sort of recalibrating your chemical shit that's going on right and i swear like whenever i don't get enough sleep i feel like i have interrupted that process and i feel very sort of like oh my god my chemicals are all out of whack and oh uh, my neck and uh, you know um uh, which is why naps don't work for me <laughs> <laughs> i never nap i never nap my girlfriend can take naps like no one's business she could just go to sleep and i'm like how the fuck do you do that how how do you do it it's like i think she has like p partial narcolepsy like she just can fall asleep this dude has literally i have literally seen him sleeping falling out like what's what's, what's <laughs> sleeping standing up falling asleep standing up words i have words what are words <laughs> What are words? You're a writer. What are words? What? Are, who needs words when you're a writer? <laughs> so I love your home. And, and I watched an interview where you were talking about how like, you know, you're, you're in the place you're in the you're still in the place with the two fireplaces, right? The what now? The two fireplaces. You still have the, the, the apartment with the two fireplaces. No. Oh, I saw an interview with you where you were like, oh, those are the two fireplaces. Was that it? Oh, was it? Yeah. And now I don't even remember living in a place with two. It's people. the same place because I because I see the wallpaper is the same. <laughs> oh, two. Oh, oh. <sighs> yes. <laughs> yes. We're off to an incredible start. Yeah, I love this interview. Look, I look. I woke up. I I woke up like an hour ago. Oh my god! Good for you. It, I wish it, I did that. Are you? Is it because you're on like pandemic time? Is that what's happening? Oh, well, no, because you actually went out too. Yeah, yeah it's because we were out so late. Otherwise, I would be like, I would be fresh as a daisy and totally articulate right now. Like, I would be so eloquent. <laughs> you're still articulate. You still sound great. Um, oh, my question is: so Lighthouse Film Festival, they actually did. They decided to do uh, live screenings, drive-in style, which was cool. Like I. I haven't been to a drive. I've only ever been to a drive-in once before, and I was like twenty. <laughs> so this was going. It was like Men in Black, you know, like 
Um, so yeah, it was really, really cool to, to see. And there, there were actually other cars there that like weren't my mom's. Um, <laughs> so that was nice. Um, they weren't messing about afterward though. I was thinking like, oh, I'll get to hang out and, and like chat with my producer for a little bit. Maybe, no, nope. they were like, no, nope, get the fuck out. Like, <laughs> y'all got to go home. We had a long day. But yeah, drive out of the drive-in, you're done. Mm-hmm. What was it like though? What was it like seeing the subject on the big screen? That must have been It was incredible. really cool. Um, we had had a private screening before at the Independent Film Channel in, in New York. Um, the, the, or the Independent Film Center um, in in New York. And um, and that was, ah, man, I'm so glad I got to have that experience because this whole, you know, digital thing, like it's cool that people who, for example, don't live in New York City and can't get to the Independent Film Center, you know, um, can see it, but I can't see them seeing it, you know? So I have no idea how or if this is, landing with anyone except that I did have that one before all this COVID shit started happening I did have that one private screening I think there were like 200 and something people in the theater which was so great because you can hear people but people were vocalizing and laughing at parts I was like oh I guess shit I guess I'm funny okay cool (laughs) but um yeah, people were were like shouting things at the or like whispering to their to their neighbor, you know, um, about stuff that was happening on the screen. And I think that's like really such a testament to the life that the actors brought and that the um, and that the director, you know, breathed into the script. Um, that you know, two hundred something people sitting in a theater could look up and like really have feelings about you know what was happening on the screen yeah um, absolutely so glad i got it, to experience sitting in there with them while they were feeling it and because online you don't know driving even i couldn't tell i'm like looking over into the i can't see into people's cars with the tinted windows and whatever all you know um so yeah um it's it's been it's been bizarre <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. And like my film, so my film is uh, the one that was in Art of Brooklyn. So I did two films in 2019, I guess. I can't remember what fucking year it is. <laughs> I did two films in 2019. And uh, I did a full-length documentary and I did a short film. So the short film was in Art of Brooklyn Film Festival and it's a comedy. So my girlfriend's also in it and she executive produced it and she like we're like partners in this thing. So we're laughing and we're like, do you think anyone's laughing? And then we got all these messages saying how funny it was and everything. But it's such a strange, but the reach, like you said, it's a strange experience. But the reach to reach a, a, a broader audience is is awesome. Like we are, we're reaching people that can't come to New York City that, uh, you know, um, she has fans. She's a former radio personality. So she has a lot of fans that are in like Minnesota and the Midwest and all, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so like, so we get to, so they get to see what we did and it's great. But how has, how have you been during the pandemic? I mean, I want to talk about your home. Well, the, originally I wanted to talk about your home because you made your home a place where you want to be. And I, and that's what I did too. Like my, you and I, like that's some very common ground that we had is I designed my home. So I'd want to stay and work in it because like all I do is work in my house. You know, like I'm ed- I'm editing, I'm in my my cave, just like uh, you know, if I'm not shooting. So, I wanted to, t- to like kind of touch on that for a minute and talk about how that is in the pandemic because I basically told everyone I was like, well, I love my home, so I'm fine not leaving. <laughs> so, what did you do to kind of make your home as a writer? As a writer, yeah. that's so important to to make a home a place where you want to stay because you're home, you know, all the time I doing this. Time. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's walk through like, that a little bit. Yeah. People keep asking, like, oh, are you okay? Like, how are you holding up? I'm like, I'm fine. <laughs> you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm the same, basically the same. Um, it sucks not being able to have people over because that's the thing that I like. I don't like crap. I'm, I'm kind of an introvert. And that really, I learned that about myself. This, uh, like, I thought maybe because, like, 
I'm friendly and I like a lot of people. Magic girl, you have the worst time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I thought like maybe, you know, I would struggle more <laughs> because I couldn't go out to the theater. I don't know if you know this about me, but I have my, my background is in theater. I'm not like, um, I, oh, I had oh, to sort of come oh, into school. I I, I have research, trust me. I, I don't just go, I'm not one of those podcasters that's like, eh, you know, fuck it, we'll just have a conversation. Like, I like having a conversation, but I also like knowing, I like, I, I say this, I do enough research to know enough about you, but also be surprised. That's that's how I feel oh. as, as when I interview people. So don't worry, I know a lot about you, but please continue. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, theater and um, and I, you know, theater, it's a live, usually collective experience, you know? And I was thinking, oh man, I'm gonna miss that, right? But like, I don't miss crowds. I don't miss being policed, um, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> by, um, by angry white people i don't miss um you know having to throw elbows i don't miss getting the suspicious treatment when i'm out in public because yeah. you know whatever and yeah there's just a lot that i don't miss out there um but i do miss having people in my home i miss having the people that i've like carefully curated <laughs> you know um and you know kept them close and in, in my life like i miss having them over for brunch i love i host i hosted so many brunches um yeah um but that's really about it otherwise i'm sitting i'm chilling i'm doing what i usually do but like braless you know and mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I love that um i'm not worried about working? right now are you working on a, <laughs> are you working on any on anything right now in terms of projects or brushing yeah. up on anything? Yeah, so right now I'm um well I just, I turned in the first draft of a um a screenplay that I worked on mercenary style, you know how they're just like here we have this idea and we just need somebody to like carry it. I'm like, "All right, cool. I'm here. Yeah, I can do it." So, um <laughs> Um, a producer from Disney called me up. She remembered me from another project that we worked on when she worked at another company. And she was like, so listen, how, how would you feel about um, doing a, an adaptation of Oliver Twist? And I was like, ah, I don't know. She's like, hear me out, hear me out. Okay, because Ice Cube came to us and I was like, go on. She oh my god like, yeah ice cube came to us and was like i want to do an adaptation of oliver Twist. basically like a bigger blacker better version of oliver twist and i was like fuck yeah like yeah let's go <laughs> like sign that actually that. sounds that's that sounds fucking awesome because does, if you no. think about it does though because when you think about it oliver twist is about not not just like marginalization for orphans you know what i mean but then if you bring the black experience into it exactly. it's just it, and because you don't hear about you rarely hear about the black orphan when you think about it right yeah. like i yeah. i've never seen a story i mean again i'm a white dude so like pretty faced you know it's blonde hair blue eyed little angels right and you're like right all right <laughs> who, 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 who that? you know like mark um but yeah, um, so yeah, me and Disney and, and Dickens and Ice Cube, is that's a thing that's happening in the world. And um, That's incredible. So after my first draft, I'm waiting for notes back um, on that. And while I do that, I'm um, in talks with a couple of companies about developing a tv series that's based on a book that i wrote it's called 101 reasons to not breed and um i started writing the book because as as a non-breeder you know i've had a lot of experiences that have made me feel less than human you know for not having and not really wanting kids you know people are like oh you'll change your mind like like my gynecologist you know is like you'll change your mind i don't you know? and i'm like D i'm gonna need you to like stay out of my uterus though you know <laughs> like i know that you're my doctor but can you please not tell me like what what to do with you know my life um 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I wrote this book, and it's a lot of crowdsourced material. Um, people, friends on Facebook, I would like post. They knew after a while, I'd be like for a project, you know, and I would ask a question like what's the most obnoxious sound to ever come out of your child? Or like, you know, what's the most ridiculous kid related expense you've ever incurred and stuff like that. And they, they gave me so much material to work with. And I wrote a literal book. And then um, I showed a little bit of the book to my manager and she was like, Oh, Hey, um, actually, I, this, this is really funny. And I think that this could be a really great TV series. And I was like, Oh, Oh, Okay, cool. So I figured out a way to make it a TV series. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, um, I had like a week of, of just hardcore pitching. Um, and two companies were like, yeah, we, we want to develop that with you. And so now they're sort of looking to figure out if it's going to be a co-production or, you know, like what the, what the next, what they're strategizing over there. My people. <laughs> that is incredible. That's incredible. That is so exciting and so awesome. And you and I now have common ground, not just only in how we design our homes, <laughs> but I'm I'm a non-breeder as well. So I decided in my last relationship, you know, I was sort of getting a bit pressure to like, do I want to be a house husband? Do I want to do this? Do I want to get have a child? And there was a time limit. And then I realized I don't want one because I, I my children are my movies and my children are my, my creative projects. And I found a partner, my girlfriend, who, who is the same. She's, she's like, I, I don't want kids. And I'm like, great. So we found each other. And it's funny. Isn't it really annoying when people say, you'll change your mind? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm like, actually, no, I'm not going to change my mind. This is what I hate, too. Oh, but you'd be such a great dad. I'm like, no, I yeah. wouldn't. I wouldn't pay attention to them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or I would, but because I'm like, I'm real OCD and a, and a little, I'm a, just like a little bit of a control freak. So I would be paying attention, right? I would be paying too much attention and I would resent every second of it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yes. Well, let me just get that confession out of the way, you know? Um, no, I, I agree w- with you. And I think that like when when you are emotionally stable enough to come to grips that you are not that you are going to be resentful of the child and you don't want to bring a child or children into the world where they're become where they're being resented and and because you're you're still pursuing something you're still pursuing pursuing your art and you just see them as an obstacle yeah and that's the mature decision to make you know what i mean yes i know what you mean (laughs) i know exactly what the fuck you mean um yeah, and it's hard talking about that with people in a um, in a way that won't have them looking at you like you're just a fucking monster, you know? And I'm like, I just, I don't, I just for so many reasons, for so many reasons, um, some physical, you know, some um, sort of psychological, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the the best parents growing up you know i got sort of passed around like an old shoe this was something that i found interesting where it said that um you were you were adopted at four in the way that like you know young black kids are adopted young black kids from broken homes are adopted where it's like oh here's okay so let me let me start from the beginning so my parents were like really young and dumb when they had me um i was born in queens New York. Um, And then my mother, like things didn't work out between my parents. They never got married. Um, I was born out of wedlock. And um, then my mother decided that she was going to run off with some military man and live with him. Um, I don't know if you know about Camp Lejeune um, down in North Carolina. Um, (laughs) It's it's a military base. It's it's famous now because there was um, toxic water. (laughs) that was like for decades the government was allowing um a metal refinery to dump toxic waste into the water supply there so um yeah so my mother and i actually we we both have uh, multiple sclerosis and we're pretty sure it's because um of the water there because no one else in the family has it you know um and we're otherwise um pretty healthy but she brought me with her down there to live with this dude 
and I don't know, this dude was not like the best stepdad. <laughs> and he would like beat the shit out of my mom. Like he beat the shit out of me. I'm like three years old. My mother was beating me down there too. Cause I don't know what, I don't know what was going on in her head, but I remember like literally one of my earliest memories is like her knocking the teeth out of my head and then putting me over her lap and trying to put my teeth back into my mouth. Um, so that was, that was like one of my first memories. Um, so this is the kind of shit that was happening to me when I'm like three, four years old, right? And then I don't know what happened, I guess. I'm, my storyteller brain is like, somebody must have noticed bruises, missing teeth, black eyes, right? Someone must have noticed and said something because she then had a you know a rare moment of sobriety and like gave me to a family friend um and i lived with that woman for the next 10 years um in newark new jersey so i grew up in newark um yeah and she, she i god bless man like what a huge-hearted woman to be just taking in kids from wherever she was just like kind of a saint in that way but she too was a little bit violent she never laid hands on me because i was a good kid right but like whew, my foster sisters <laughs> and brothers you know she didn't have time for bullshit so you know she would come home from work she was tired and then, you know if somebody looked at her cross eyes she'd smack them you know like that kind of stuff so even like <laughs> on on the good days there was like a smack upside the head or something you know so anyway um this is the this is the that's my early <laughs> you know those are my formative experiences right it was like abuse and abandonment and like and poverty honestly because like this woman who took me in she wasn't rich you know she's working two three jobs most of the time um, to take care of other people's kids, which, you know, is, is crazy to me, but I'm glad she did it. And then um, I got a scholarship to what I thought was a boarding school. Turns out it was not a boarding school. So I moved in with a host family, a wealthy white host family, which was like colonizing a whole other planet. Like it was like, <laughs> it was an insanely different experience right so growing up um so this was from ages 14 on um and i consider i consider that family my family now. like they're they're like i call her my mom like she's she's my mom you know um and we still keep in touch and um she lives two towns over <laughs> you know so i go i go visit even during quarantine um but yeah that that was so i had like a, a pretty wide range of experiences as far as like um approaches to parenting we'll say um and yeah like coming to come coming to that 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 family where it was like you know they have enough resources and you know, they allocate those resources in such a way that like their kids are really taken care of and like, oh, you are struggling in that subject, let's hire you a tutor, right? And I'm like, oh, that's an option, you know, like shit like that, that I'm like, oh, there's a lot that goes into doing the parenting thing right, you know, and I just don't, I don't know that I have that in me, <laughs> right? Um, so my experiences have really led me to the conclusion that like, oh, this is not something that I can, this is not something that I can do um, full heartedly or with any kind of, um, you know, like uh, my, my foundation is, 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 is it's, it's not there, right? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. W when you're going through those experiences, at that age, I mean, you know, that that's that's the part hearing stories like this make me realize how great I had it. You know what I mean? And how difficult it was for so many people out there. And mm -hmm. and and you look at these like idyllic upbringings and things and then you hear stories like this and you're my endless curiosity is, you know, because I went through shit when I was a kid. We all go through shit. Like no one's, no family's perfect. No parents are perfect, but I never went through what you did. Um, how did you escape from that creatively? 
Where were you escaping creatively? <laughs> I didn't. I use that shit. I use it. I use it in my writing. Um, I use, I mean, you saw the subject, you know, the mother um, who confronts the documentarian at the end of the film, you know, he really, he really goes in, like he interrogates her. Um, a lot of the experiences that I had um, growing up, like <laughs> there's like a line about Disney World or something in it. Um, she says, oh yeah, um, I guess the, the only vacation I ever had was to go down to Florida, but it was for my daddy's funeral. So I'm not sure that's really a vacation. My son, like, you know, my son, he didn't want to go. And, but the only way I convinced him because he was eight at the time so, or nine or whatever, right? Like the only way I could get him to agree to go was um, by telling him um, we might go to Disney World. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and then, you know, of course, there's that disappointment of like, he figures out that they're not going to Disney World, but he's still, and he's so quiet on the plane ride back, right? So like there's, I never got to go to Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's still time maybe after the pandemic there's still time right maybe i can get maybe i can get like free free vip passes from my my current employer <laughs> yeah it's one of the things you can have written in is like hey i never got to go to disney world could you fucking just give me one trip you know i mean look you're not missing out on much it's just, it's a lot of people in costumes you know it's just it's fun. I guess it's fun. I don't know. I went when I was younger and I was just a brat. So I don't remember. But yeah, it, it works its way into my work. Like all of that. Like I, 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 I stick it in there in some permutation or other. Um, also, what I appreciated about the subject and uh, and your writing in general is that you can tell that you have a very broad view of the world, um, especially in terms of writing white folks. You know what I mean? Because sometimes... I feel like sometimes we, me as me as a white guy, if I'm writing a black person, I can sort of go into uh, tropes and uh, assumptions that aren't correct or aren't right. But you having the the black experience plus then the white experience and a little bit more of the the seeing the privileged side of the white experience, whereas it's I've like when I say privileged. <laughs> When I say privilege is like getting a tutor, that that is privilege, you know, <laughs> having the having the resources to have a tutor and kind of like get a good education. Like, unfortunately, that is a sign of privilege where I feel like education shouldn't be a, a sign of it shouldn't be. An education shouldn't be privilege. Everyone should have the right to have a fucking education in this country. I'm going off on my own shit, but I want to get back to you. So, <laughs> I'm with it, though. I'm with it. Oh, it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy that people don't have access to education in this country yeah. because of because of their race, because of race and because of economic circumstances. It's just mm -hmm. insane. Because you had the sort of the, the white, not sort of, but you had the white and the black experience. You, I loved the way you wrote white characters. I'm like, well, that's spot on. Like, I know dudes like him, you know, and and you didn't. He wasn't what I loved about Jason Biggs character is that he wasn't cartoonishly bad. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, he was. Yeah, no, I he, he, yeah, and you said something about um, proof of love, which is, you know, you're just writing about humans dealing with human shit. And like that hit me so hard. And I'm like, that's why I loved the movie. And that's why it was effective and effectively reached me because I saw two different classes of people two different races grappling with their own shit. And you created in an odd way, you created a defense for both of them. And now I might be reading into that wrong, but for me, it was like, fuck, he's a documentarian. He's doing what he was told to do as a documentarian. I don't want to give too much away. And then you see the mother's pain and her pain and her experience of like, you fucking exploited us. You know what I mean? Like you exploited my son and, and, and tragedy occurred. Um, is that what you were going for in the subject? Did you want that push and pull from the audience? Like who, like, did you yeah. want people to say, who do I agree with? Absolutely. Um, I get so tired of these, like, you know, mustache twirly, <laughs> you know, racist villains you know and i'm and it's like no who who's looking at that and is like yeah 
that I can relate, you know, to that guy. And there's a distancing that happens that makes people feel safe and smug. And I fucking hate that. Like, I hate that. Like, I hate when people, any people, you know, like not just white people, I'm not just trying to pick on white people, but like any people who can walk out of a theater, you know, feeling like patting themselves on the back because like, hey, at least they're not that guy, you know, I'm like, mm. No, that ain't do it. That you didn't, you didn't get it. it. Yeah, you didn't get it. You did not get it. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I really much prefer um, trying. I, I really try to create characters who, yeah, they're flawed in these deep ways, right? You know, they're deeply flawed characters, um, but who, you know, if you're paying attention, you're maybe feeling a little bit um a little bit indicted <laughs> yourself you know and asking yourself oh shit wait but do i do that oh and then maybe you'll like quietly shamefully change your behavior you know like yeah like okay mom a black mom right who's working two jobs like we feel you we see you um but like, okay, how did your kid, why is he not going to school though? You know, and, and granted there are like so many factors, you know, that, that play into that. Like I get it, having grown up how I grew up, right? Um, but, you know, there there is a little bit of like, uh... There was, yeah, there was one line that affected me so greatly when I was watching the film and it's at a, it's at a pretty big climax in the film. And I, again, I don't want to give too much away. So, so if I'm saying something that you don't want to be given away, just give me the, don't, you know, but <laughs> they're arguing. Um, the, the two main characters are arguing, the mother and the director. And... Um, and she says, he says, well, see, you were never there for him. And then she said, do you know what it's like having a child and having to work two jobs? And that shone a light on him about how ignorant he is to the black experience and mm -hmm. to, and that was so poignant for me because I'm like, you're a documentarian, but you, you still didn't get to the truth of the, or the heart of the matter, which exactly. was what? Why was he feeling? Why was he feeling that way? Why was he feeling unloved by his mother? And the reason was because of the system set up against black people. <laughs> she mm -hmm. had to work two to three jobs to actually afford to have this child and to afford them a good life. And she thought she was giving him a good life, but yet the child still felt cheated. And I look, I'm not saying that I, I, I'm saying that is that is a more common experience I feel uh, in the in the black community than it is the white community. I'm not saying that there aren't white people who aren't economically challenged. I think that that's it would be crazy not to say that. And and yeah. some white families do go through that as well. But it's I loved though. It's disproportionate. It's completely disproportionate. Mm -hmm. It's completely disproportionate. And but going back to that conversation, it it made me it made me feel so much for her in that moment and i mean the acting is it, the acting is unreal you know it's so good look Ajani, it's so good she killed it she just killed it <laughs> um and she did it she literally rewrote some parts which was, was cool i'm like look you're the one sitting in the character feeling the feelings you know um so there were some moments that I was like, oh, yeah, that, you know, even just sort of, yeah. And she would say that, you know, um, oh, the, the acting. And Jason was was no slouch. Like that to see like, him in a role like that. Yeah. Was, right. <sighs> yeah. So good. He nailed yeah. it now. But this was you have so many plays. You did so many plays before doing screenplays you know you have such a rich history with it um i want to go through that you know f f that w all of the plays that lead up to the subject because the subject was a play before it was a movie mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and in your history of writing um 
plays, you experienced so many personal uh, revelations, you know? Um, so I want to walk through kind of what you experienced as you're writing these plays, what it does to your own personal growth. Yeah, this was pretty early on in my career. Like I wrote the sub, I think the subject was like my third full length play ever that I wrote. Second, if you, if you're not counting like, you know, my, my undergrad thesis or whatever. Right. So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll call it the second. It was the, really the second um, play that I that I ever wrote. And I did, I wrote it in grad school, um, not really knowing much about, like while I was still learning about craft and things. But as far as like the actual, like the content and the, um, you know, ha having to depict the characters in such a way that like really illustrates an understanding of their perspective. Um, mm, it took six drafts for me to get to a place where it, it where it was so where it wasn't so transparent it, it, my my hatred for Phil you know <laughs> like like i really had to i really had to dig like and really think like put myself into the position of someone oh hey street sweeper um, put myself in into the position of someone who has probably never even met a black person until his late twenties, maybe you know when he was in grad school, or you know what I mean, like, and met that one cool black guy and was like, "Ooh, yeah, you know." Uh, oh yeah, this is the black experience. This, this is, is this is everything I need to know experience. about black people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, yeah, yeah. So I really had to to put myself in the position of someone who would not be able to, you know, who. And it's so hard because I'm as a black person, like I have had to like, of course, I'm like plugged into the black experience, but like for survival purposes, I also have to be very in tune with what the hell non black people are thinking all the time, too. Right? Like I have to I have to have race dar, you know, like I have to like, in order to successfully navigate the world, you know, like I really, I have to um, have like Richter scale sensitivity to like what people, what is motivating people's actions and their speeches as far as like, you know, like through the lens of race, right? Um, yeah, so it, it was hard for me to like put myself in the position of someone who never had to take into account how people who are not of the same race, right, are feeling or like what their experience might be. Like there are so many, particularly white people because they are like the dominant culture, you know, like they don't have to like, good God, like I have been shamed, shamed from like, from from every which way like for not having seen the princess bride right i still haven't on gp but like you know the princess bride right and it's like oh my god oh my god i haven't seen the princess bride oh my god i can't believe you haven't seen the princess bride like what rock have you been living under oh my god the princess bride I right love, like, i love is... the becky voice <laughs> the becky voice drives <laughs> me becky crazy voice. Oh um, my God! Well, I'm the like, Becky well, voice. Becky, have you seen School Days? Because that's what I was growing up on, you know. And of course, Becky hasn't seen School Days, you know. Why? Or, or any she? black, or any like, black cinema, you know. It's like you know, there's 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 a whole world of rich, amazing black cinema outside of like a Tyler Perry, Perry movie. Not say, I mean, look, I I actually love. I think Tyler Perry is is has employed more black people in this country and has given black back to the black community than mo than anyone, you know, than, oh my God. So true. you have to give him his Different credit. You have to give him his credit where his credit is due. Yeah, yeah. Do I find flaws in his writing and his characters? Yes, absolutely. I think that, you know, I think that that's a thing, but, but, you know, white folks have to dig deep into black cinema because it's there and it exists and it's wonderful. And it is a rich history of cinema that is, um, that is so vast you know, um, yeah, I, I it, and it drives me crazy that some that anyone would be like, you haven't seen Princess Bride. Like, who cares? Like, you know, what I, you know what I mean? That doesn't make you 
that doesn't that would never that wouldn't make you understand anything different or whatever i mean it's an it's a great fucking movie i love the movie but you know i it, it, it's insane that people would even say like oh i can't believe you haven't seen that movie and you're like mm -hmm. really okay uh yeah. but, but let's but, stay yeah, let's stay default, on the default yeah. is white so it's like you can't you can't escape it and i really had you, you as a you know you have to put yourself in the position of someone else and like really think about what that would be like to just wake up and have like every commercial represent you and have every you know like 80 percent of the politicians you know be looking out for your interests and like you know just <sighs> representation representation matters absolutely you know? yes and representation and and also like what i'm seeing from my white friends right now look i'm not saying i'm fucking perfect i have my flaws but for me uh, you know, Black Lives Matter is a lifetime commitment for me. You know what I mean? Like a, a, a black standing by black people, black issues, having black friends is is a lifelong thing for me. It's not it's not something that I do when um, when a tragedy happens and someone is killed. You know, I mean, like and that's I'm seeing a lot of my white friends go through what I call white panic and they are just panicking right now they're like what do i do what do i say how do i fix this and then it's exhausting black folks because it's like what do you do don't go to your fucking black friends your one black friend who's like dude i'm just trying to fucking eat my eggs like what what are you asking me questions about race now like can't you fucking figure this out it's it, this is a lifetime commitment and it's not just like do it when um you know do it when it's convenient you know like i've listened to the stoop the podcast for like years because I want to understand the black experience. I want to understand what black women and black people in this country go through, you know, and that's how you learn. That's how you do it. And you don't advertise it. You can silently support it, but also support it vocally too. But you don't have to be like every day, like I'm listening to a black podcast. You know what I mean? <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's what, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> here here's yeah. your here's your woke trophy here are your woke points for the day you know yeah. so so i have my i have my issues with the way people are approaching it but i do think it's good i think we are in the second civil rights movement but i'm like motherfuckers we couldn't get 50 years of this shit we couldn't get it right like what the fuck so sorry i went off on a little bit of a tangent oh no that's a, I'm i'm down with that tangent but um <laughs> yeah it's i literally i just I posted on Facebook a while ago because I had a day. Literally, I, all I wanted to do was like read some plays and like maybe work on something and watch Insecure, right? Like that's-, that's I love that I, show. But who, oh my God. Who, who cannot love like, <laughs> I got to quote my friend, our Eric Thomas. He says, whomst among us. <laughs> <laughs> Whomst among us does not love insecure. So that's all I wanted to do this day. What did I actually wind up doing this day? I spent hours, literally hours. Like I'm not exaggerating. It had to be between six and seven hours, somewhere in there, just talking white people off the ledge. I got an email from someone who was like, oh my God, racism, right? And I was like, okay. Um, so I'm like, email them, and I love this person, right? So I emailed her back or whatever. But then I get people, this was the same day, I think that um, the We See You letter to the American theater, to white American theaters went out. And so I had a couple people reach out to me to be like, hey, uh, what, does it, what does paragraph two mean? Or what do you mean by what? I don't understand. Can you illustrate for me the point in paragraph number five? You know, like I had a couple of people reach out to me like specifically about that letter. There were other folks like friends calling up and being like either they were people that like I haven't spoken to in like years. Right. Being like, hey, I just wanted to like check in on you. I'm like, I'm good. Like, <laughs> you know, like I, I didn't have to like stop and like check in with people like I could just be living my life right now you know that was one thing that I did that was one thing that I did that I learned uh from having black friends because I wanted to I, in in my own way I wanted to let them know that I care and that I was there should they need any emotional support or anything right so I reached out to like all of my black friends and was like 
hey, are you okay? Most of them were grateful, but one uh, had said to me, yeah, I'm fine, dude. Like, you, there's other stuff you could do besides like texting me if I'm okay. <laughs> and it was a good lesson to have, though. But this is why I'm saying, if you have black friends, like most of the people that are yelling online that are white, I look at their friends list. I'm like, you don't have one black friend on your list. Like, and I'm not saying like go out and make a black like for for your own selfish fucking reasons. I'm like, do it because you like, like an them. Episode of Seinfeld. <laughs> yes. 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 Or, or there's like, there's like stuff you could do long term, like support, support black shows. Like I, I fucking love Insecure so much. I can't, I want to, I do want to talk to you a little bit about that. There's so much to go over with you though. But, um, but this is a great conversation because I feel like this is what everyone needs to hear. It's some hard truths. You know what I mean? And it's just what I've observed as a person. And like I said, Chisa, I'm not saying that I'm like the most perfect white person. I think I'm fucking flawed as fuck. You know what I mean? I think that I have so many, I have so much inside of me that needs to be worked on, not just in terms of race, but in terms of being a human, you know what I mean? But, but when I see the, like the, the overcompensation without thinking of the long term, it drives me absolutely insane. So you yeah. you even said something in your email to me back. I, I won't quote it exactly because I don't have it, but you you were like, I basically become a spokesperson. Um, uh-huh. And, you know, I, it, 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 again, it's it's kind of like that's that's what's wrong in this situation is putting it on a black person to say, well, now you have to speak to white people about the black experience. Yeah. And what I've done, I've started a hashtag, I'm hoping it catches fire, called tag in white friend. And I have like a few, I have like a good handful of white friends who I would legit trust to be my proxy in situations where I'm like, here is somebody coming at me with some nonsense or a question or a well-meaning something or other, but I find it irritating. Can you just deal with it, please? (laughs) And I literally, that's what I do. Like I tag in white, I've had to do it like a couple times already, like just the past couple weeks, Um, (laughs) where I'll I'll, like just out here, oh, you want a whole fucking list of black playwrights, you know, that, you know, to, to maybe sort of, you know, try to figure out how you can incorporate some of their work into your curriculum at so-and-so university. You want me to sit down and like type all that shit out and do the research for you? Mm, How about I tag in white friend who is all about that? How about I just put you in touch with, you know? And here is someone, I actually got that message, the like, hey, can you point me in the direction of some really great black players? And I was like, (sighs) Um, I got that message from a person who saw my post. She was reaching out to tell me that she thought it was funny. She's like, oh my God, tag in white friend. That's hilarious. And then proceeded to ask me a question that was exactly the, the, like the kind of thing that I'm trying to avoid where it's like, here, can you just like, can you just like, diversity up my curriculum for me like you know like can you just like in your spare time like can you just like give me a reading list and i'm like hmm. <laughs> so it's like it's like in between you dealing with all of this emotionally you know uh uh, yeah. uh kind of internally you know through can you also do this because we really want to start diversifying it up a little bit you know yeah. it's like what the and i was fuck? like tag in white friend you know um and god boy, i love my friend sarah she's so amazing but yeah there are like i'll say there there are some 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 really awesome white people out there who can actually answer those questions for you also. And I highly advise this black people, if you're exhausted, right. To just, um, to tag in a white friend (laughs) Um, and be like, Hey, I trust you. Go, go deal with it. (laughs) And (laughs) also like, I, yeah, I think a lot, a lot too is like, I is, is I think one of the greatest things that has happened, um, Sadly, through the through the events that have had have unfolded in the last three four months, um, is that finally white people are going? Oh, it is that bad. I I don't understand why they didn't know it before. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I'm like, okay, glad to, glad you've joined us. Glad you're here. 
glad you understand now. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, this is what we've been saying for a long time. You know, this is, this is what we've been trying to tell you. Uh, and this is what most, this is what every black person has told you. This is not false. This is real. These things happen. All right. I want to get back to your plays and, and you as an artist. Um, I'm glad we had that tangent though. I'm glad we talked about that because I think it's good for white people to hear about it. And, and I think it's also good to be like, figure it out. You figure it out. You know, you figure it out. I'm not going to follow up with a question for you saying, well, how can white people get better? No, you figure it out. Go figure it out. Here, take the training wheels off. Go fucking figure it out. Um, so, so, so I want to talk about this was one was very seminal experience in your life when you were in high school and you saw August Wilson and uh, Robert Brustein talk. What happened to you during that debate? Ah. Uh. <laughs> So many feels, so many thoughts. First of all, um, okay, so this was at a point, I think I was maybe a junior in high school at this point, and I had been acting because acting and improv was like the only theater class really that you could take. Like you couldn't take a directing class, right? So it's high school. So um, so I was taking acting and improv and I was like in the school plays, right? And I would, I was being cast in these ridiculous roles like roles that I had no business playing right as like a 15 year old black girl from Newark, New Jersey right like I had no business playing any of this stuff and um I remember um going to this hall and it was packed right because this was when people like really gave a shit about theater right so like there were it was packed there's August Wilson Robert Brustein and um like I was up in the rafter, like like fucking scout in in To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, like up in the rafters, like leaning over the, you know. So I'm up there and I'm listening to them, and um and Robert was saying, you know, okay, you know, cool, cool. He's like, oh yeah, colorblind casting, you know, because really, um, a really skilled actor can take any story and like, you know, um you know, and, 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 and make it their own and, you know, and all this, you know, and yada, yada, schmeck, schmeck, colorblind casting, hurrah, hurrah. Right. And I was like, eh, 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 you know, um, August Wilson, on the other hand, was like, that's bullshit. Robert Bruce saying, here's why. Um, it's lazy. Um, if you really want to like employ actors of color, like every muscle, every fiber of their being, right? Then you need to put them in plays that are actually about people of color because they bring all that shit in and they don't have to like act in spite of it, right? You know, like if I'm playing my little 17 year old self playing Antigone, right? And I'm the only black girl in the damn play right and is many whatever you know is blonde and she's supposed to be my sister and shit and i'm sitting there i'm on stage and i've got this double consciousness thing going where i'm like trying to act with her but i'm also like is the audience even buying it like or do are they out there thinking like oh is this a political statement like and suddenly i'm a political statement and i'm not a person right so i'm up there and i'm you know i'm trying to act but i'm like acting in this human role, despite the fact that I'm black, right? And I, that just clicked for me listening to August Wilson talk about that and like, you know, listening to him say like that, that basically like people of color are ignoring parts of themselves when they are cast in traditionally white roles, right? Um, and they're always going to have, there's always going to be that little piece of them that's like thinking about how the audience is taking in this brown body, right, on stage that that's supposed to be, you know, a, a paramour in Mantua somewhere, wherever the fuck, right? Like, it's, it's not, it's not fair. And it's a waste, you know, and August Mosen was like, you know, further y'all are just using this whole like, you know, well, the classics are universal. Y'all are just using that as an excuse to not actually tell stories about people of color. And that may be like the biggest insult of all, right? The fact that your stories get to be universal, whereas ours are just like a, a, a quaint, you know, 
<laughs> like a little, a, 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 a cute little detour, you know, from the universal. Oh, and then we bring it right back. Right. It's, it's, it's insulting. You know? It's also it's also a sign of white supremacy is that yes, we you know, it it's like, hey, you know what? Well, this this literature has been around for, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of whatever years. And, you know, and we just uh, we, we need to focus on that and keep that alive. You know, and it's like, well, what the fuck? But what about my experience? It's interesting what you said. How do you find a lot of that? So one, one of my biggest problems about Hollywood and and what they do in terms of like trying to be woke and i noticed again it, this feeds into white panic which i i I, ho I think i should trademark that <laughs> white people panic there's a there was this panic when when like when when everything when this when i feel like the second civil rights movement started really bubbling up a few years back also with me too and uh and everything like that is that um Hollywood was like, okay, great. Well, now let's just remake Ghostbusters but make all of them women and one of them black. I'm like, why not write a fucking original story? Why not write something original that that is like good? And that's why I love Insecure because Insecure is like is like, hey, look, hey, look, the human experience. The it's just there's there's it's just the fucking human experience. I love that show. It's Issa writes just perfectly i mean it's directed beautifully it's shot beautifully the taste level of cinematography is incredible the editing's incredible and it's just pure entertainment and there's no like why well, don't I understand it because it's black people no it's just the human experience you know what i mean <laughs> and that to me that was the biggest groundbreaking show in such a long time because it did what I've wanted to see for so long. It's like, we're not going to rehash an old show. We're not going to take the X-Files and make it to black people. No, we're going to fucking write a brand new show about the black experience, about dating in the black world. Uh, uh, or, and, and, and it is such a, it's, it's not just a black and white thing. It's a human show. It's a human experience. So, so I find it interesting that you as like Antigone or, or or who you said, it's like, yeah, of course you can't relate. You're, you are in a black body. How do you embody like, how, okay. So you, you're saying you just want me to be a black person in this role and try to speak in this role. And it has nothing to do with my culture. It has nothing to do with my experience. I can't pull from anything in my life to make, to make this happen. And I think that that's where, you know, at the end of that show, you get a lot of uh, a lot of old white folks who go to plays going, that was so brave. It was so brave of you to put yourself in that experience, you know, and it's like, fuck. So so did that did that really I think I knocked my I'm getting so riled up. So, <laughs> so did that. You get it, right? Like I, but I, I like this is what I've been trying to shout at my fellow whiteies. I'm like, guys, this is what we shouldn't be doing. Like, this, like, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't just remake something and put a bunch of black folks in it and say, now we're woke. You know what I mean? Like, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Does that talk and that experience lead you to she likes girls? Honestly, when I wrote that play, I wasn't really given any fucks about white theater at that in that moment um i wasn't thinking about it in terms of like oh how will this compare to an arthur miller what, what i don't know right like i i will that that didn't cross my mind really i just wanted to um i saw a life get snuffed out um and i responded to it you know um i wanted to honor that life with a play and she like girls was the result of that, and it 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 had nothing really to do with like oh, uh, bravery or um, like I didn't I I didn't feel courageous writing that play or anything because it was just it needed to be done, <laughs> you know. I was just like fuck, man. Like why why are there, you know, in the months following her death why were there only 26 articles published about Sakia Gunn versus the like 3000 and something articles that were published about Matthew Shepard after his death. Right. Like, and that pissed me off. Um, I thought that was tr like tremendously insulting. Um, and so, yeah, I wrote the play as a means to, to, as a way to try to, um, correct that, to try to compensate for that. And, um, 
yeah and it, i wasn't really thinking in terms of like oh you know here's a cutting edge story you know it's never here's a story yeah, that's no I, I, yeah i didn't mean not. i'm sorry i didn't mean to form my question like that i just meant that was it born out of frustration you know, was it oh, born absolutely. out of? It was frustration yeah. more out of like a an, a an event that happened in the world, and not necessarily like with the the state of American theater. You know, <laughs> and then that wins a Glad Award, and does that pretty much set it up for you? Like that that play being the first one, does that set it off for for more for more opportunities coming down the line? Like, what was the trajectory from that? People have this idea that like, oh, once you write your breakout play, like, you know, I guess she like goes to my breakout play. But let me tell you about the slowest breakout ever. Like the it, this, this was a slow motion breakout. OK, because it was like she like girls, which was like the first and only like good New York Times review that I got, you know, and I, they reviewed me I, like five or six more times after that. And every time it was like, man. <laughs> Um, so slow motion breakout. Um, yeah. And I just, I still feel a lot like I have to fight for opportunities in theater. Um, which is, you know, everybody has to fight for, well, <laughs> plenty well, of people I mean, have to fight well, for opportunities. Well, look, uh, in, yeah. In I mean, just, just to touch on that. I mean, t again, common ground. I, I just did an interview uh, for a show on our network, and it, and it focuses mainly on, on women, but they wanted to invite men on the show to kind of get the male experience as well. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned something like, I've had to I've had to fucking fight for everything I got, you know, like I don't I don't wake up in piles of money and, and people knocking down my door, you know, like I'm not I, I, I get it. I get where I'm privileged, but I still have to fight in this fucking business to even get people to listen to my podcast. You know what I mean? It's not like I wake up and things are just handed to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think I, I, I feel I, what I mean is I feel you on that. Is that like, I get it. I get that you got to fucking work. You got to work for this, yeah. you, know? you and know? Everybody has to work. It's just some people have to work a little harder, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, and I think that there are probably just a lot more factors working against me. I, I can't even, uh, I'm, I'm not even going to get into it. I'm just going to like focus on the opportunities that I that I did have and that I do have and like be grateful for those um, and, and, you know, throw elbows to create more. Like I, I can't, God, if I just sat down and um, focused on, you know, whatever opportunities I felt I was robbed of for this, that, or the other reason, then I would never, I would never get out of bed. Like I just wouldn't, I would just, I would have given up. I would be a fucking florist. <laughs> right now you know like yeah you know, yeah no i get it i'm a floor like fuck i would actually that doesn't sound like a, a terrible way to spend a day you know amongst flowers <laughs> <laughs> to be a far to be a far oh my god i would love it Florence. i would love to just i go i go i don't know do you do you do you get out in in nature at all you, you're still in jersey right yeah. yeah yeah so do you get out do you get out I to like anything person I'm yeah. a city girl. I have learned that about myself also, where I'm like, oh, I don't, mm. we have a beautiful park near us called Branch Brook Park. It's gorgeous. People come here from all over the world because we have the highest concentration of cherry blossom trees in, um, the, in North America. And um, you would think <laughs> that I would maybe like, take advantage of that but you not don't so <laughs> not so much i would rather stay home and binge watch insecure like that's that's where I, that's that's where i am you and i are, are we really we it's so interesting because i'll have guests on the show where i just i know i'm a kindred spirit with them and when when i saw your home and then when i now talking to you about nature it's so <laughs> funny because you have to drag me kicking and screaming into nature I just started to kind of like hike, you know, and I'm like, 
Ah, uh, hiking, hiking is like, uh, you know, but I, but going upstate New York, it's beautiful and, and things like that. But I'm like, yeah, but bugs, like we're going to bring bugs home. <laughs> I'm like, I can't do that. But there's a, my compromise. And I love that you're like, well, there's a park next door. That's how city folk you're like, yeah, I go to the park. That's my nature. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. cement and there's trees, I, but there's I'm a, a there's a, no, not, no, not a camping, I, hiking, I will okay. never go camping. I found a new love for hiking upstate. I I had I found a new love for it as long as there's a trail and there's access to like there's access there's like I could see a building somewhere. I do <laughs> I do understand the connection. It's nice. It is nice. But where I am, I live across the street from Greenwood Cemetery in in Brooklyn and it's more like a nature preserve like there's there's like trees and and birds and it's it's amazing. And uh and I go there every like after this i'll go there for an hour and just like sit and listen but mm-hmm. but the safety is that brooklyn is two steps away <laughs> yes. see that's the beautiful thing about living in brooklyn or any like anywhere in the tri-state area right because it's, it's like yeah. ah butterflies and like foliage or whatever right across the street from <laughs> you know A building like, do you do you remember any of Queens at all? Do you remember um, any of it? No, I mean, yes, because my dad, like once I came back up here after um, having that horrific experience with my biological mother down south, um, I came back up here to live in Newark, New Jersey. My dad was right across the way. Like he was still in Queens. He's still in Queens right now, actually, Jamaica, Queens. Um, so he, you know, he was like a every other weekend, you know, kind of presence in my life. Um, so yeah, I would be back and forth across Manhattan all the time, getting to Queens, and um, I remember every time, like man, looking out the car window at these brown stones and at these really pretty buildings with these tall windows and seeing the lights. And this is like, I'm such a, I'm such a voyeur. Um, and like looking into people's houses and seeing their like big tall ceilings and like their art hanging on the walls. And I'd be like, yeah, man, like one day, <laughs> you know, one day. And now, yeah. I, you know, so getting back to the like creating your home, creating your space, right? Like, I mean, you can see like I have the, that art hanging. Uh, I love it. This fell off the wall, unfortunately, but like I keep. This this heart this this home is full of art and love, you know. Like there's like we're we're running out of wall space. We're gonna have to start hanging shit on the ceilings, you know. <laughs> like, um, but I um, I I it's as someone who grew up in a less than beautiful environment, you know, with like Goodwill furniture and nothing on the walls and you know roaches <laughs> and whatever yeah. right yeah i need for my space to be clean and peaceful and artful that makes sense you you it sounds like you found peace you know and that you make a peaceful environment from an upbringing of uh of turmoil you know and then that's it when you get to a point in your life where you're like i want peace and this is my home and this is how i can make that peace happen um i'm so grateful you did this we're already over an hour i'm sorry i'm taking uh I've, I've, we've gone 11 minutes over so i want to kind of wrap this things up fun, and i ain't even worried about it <laughs> i had i i this was a blast i i it was so funny because i I just, I remember seeing the subject and being like, okay, I need to talk to the writer. Um, congratulations too. You guys swept at uh, Art of Brooklyn. You guys won a bunch of awards. I'm yeah. well-deserved. Well, well, well-deserved. I'm sure it's going to go on to win many more and, and all and all that stuff. Um, I guess, you know, you mentioned school days and one of my big questions is uh, what was one of your, you know, one of like the movie when you were growing up for you? Uh, was it School Days? What was the film that you were like, whoa, that, 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 that's my movie. That's the one. Actually, it was Do the Right Thing. I am a big Spike fan. Um, I will always be a big Spike fan. <laughs> have, you, have you seen, have you seen The Five Bloods? I haven't. Okay. So, 
So it is the best, I have to say, it's one of the best cinematic experiences I've ever had in my life. And um, what's the the guy, Lindo, the the lead, Lindo, um, um, fuck, I'm going to forget his name. They should just hand him the statue. Just hand him the <laughs> Academy Award. He, he does. You think that, but guess what? Oh, wait, no. A white dude just lost 89 pounds. They're going to give him the Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. is this scene. There is this scene in Defy Bloods, and then I promise we'll get back to your your um, what you were going to say, where he's giving a, a monologue to the camera, and he's sweating. I have never seen a performance like this. I have never seen someone give, and I thought, and I thought, oh my God, how, as a director, I go into, Spike must have given him such a space to do that and created such an environment for him to do that, or just been like, I trust you, go. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And like, I, it's, and, and not only that, it's an entertaining movie, right? It's this really entertaining movie that follows all these great cinematic tropes of like a treasure hunt and Vietnam and all of these kind of great, like it hits on all these great movie points, right? But it wraps it up into race relations, not just about black folks, but about the Vietnamese and that culture and how each culture was marginalizing each other. It's, it's, I, I, I please go watch it. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to watch I'm it again tonight. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I'm going to do that. Check. Um, oh, you know what really, I mean, got me, this is, I'll never forget it. Fourth grade. Okay. Blessed Sacrament School in Newark, New Jersey. Um, fourth grade for social studies, they showed us glory. That, I mean, I was not prepared. I was not prepared. I wasn't ready. My little eleven-year-old self was not, could not handle Denzel shirtless, be, with the tear streaming down. But he's not screaming or nothing. He's just, and I, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. But I was. I. I but I was because that made me really understand the power of a good story, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> we are we are definitely gonna be real life friends. I, I I loved I loved every second of this. I'm so grateful you took an hour and a half out of your day to talk to me. Um that's it. Anything else? <laughs> Black Lives Matter. That's all. <laughs>